Well, hello everyone. It is so great to be with all of you today and I just wanted to welcome all of you uh, joining us here at Center Street Church here at Central Campus, but all of those of you who are joining us online, as well as our larger church family that is meeting together at one of our campuses in Airdrie, Bearspaw, Bridgeland, and South Calgary. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt, and I'm the family pastor here, leading and serving our children, our students, and our youth at all of our campuses. And as has already been mentioned today, uh, it is Mother's Day, and so I just want to emphasize again, moms, that you really matter to God and to us. But I recognize that today may be a time where some of us may be grieving because it is a reminder of a journey that you've been on and a story that you wish wasn't true. Maybe you're in a season of inf infertility. Maybe you lost your mom or you lost a child or you had a mother that wasn't uh, pr there for you or you're in a season of singleness or you have strained relationships or you maybe are an empty nester and you're missing the days when everyone was home. If any of these things describe you, please know you matter. And I'm so glad that you're here today to worship God in the midst of your pain. Because he is the only one who can comfort all of us in our time of need. So please join me in dedicating this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for this time that we have to worship together, to glorify your name and God, I'm thankful for the ways that you are faithful, the ways that you guide and direct us. And I ask today that you would speak to us through your word. And I pray all this in your powerful name. Amen. So one of the things that we love to do as a family is we love to head to the mountains and go for hikes. And these hikes, they're small. And I stress the word small hikes because clearly... I am not a mountaineer or a climber, all right? I'm a hiker, all right, who does best when the path, it's paved. And the surface is flat, okay? <laughs> Uh, but at some point on the hike, we, are, we stop by the river and we sit down and that's when the inevitable happens. When all of our kids, they run down to the river and they start throwing everything that they can into the water. The dirt, all of the, the wood, their siblings, they throw everything into the water. And when eventually everything settles down, they begin throwing every rock that they can find into that water. Now, over time, there came a point when my kids wanted to learn how to skip a rock. And so we would go and I would show them how to find that perfect rock. And then I would tell them why this worked. And then I would show them the angle that they would have to throw it at and the amount of force that they would have to throw it with. And, and so that the rock would skip across the top of the water. But regardless of how smooth the rock was, Regardless of how hard they threw it, the rock would eventually sink. Another activity that we love to do as a family um, is play board games. And one of the games that we were really into for a while um, was the game Battleship. Remember? Battleship. And uh, my kids are awesome at this game. I'm horrible. Uh, and either they were signaling each other where all of my battleships were, or I am a very predictable person. Uh, but each time I heard you, I said, you sunk my battleship, uh, I watched all my battleships sink, and I just got thinking about how big battleships actually are. They weigh thousands of tons and they don't sink, they float. And I know, I know, there's science involved, I know, because they weigh slightly less uh, than the weight of the water that they displace. But my point is, rocks sink, but battleships can float. One of the goals of our parenting is to make sure that we launch our kids to grow and develop them into responsible and trustworthy, loving Christ followers who understand that their role in this world and their God-given purpose. And sometimes when we launch our kids, it feels like we're, we're skipping a stone. 
And despite our best efforts, we see that rock losing momentum and it sometimes it sinks. But what if we changed what we were trying to launch? What if instead of launching skipping stones that eventually sink, we launch battleships that are ready to cut through the waters of life? So how do we do that? Now, as you'll see in a moment, everything I'm going to be sharing today is something that all of us need to hear. It applies to any follower of Christ because God's call on every single person who follows Christ is that we would be, but also make disciples of Jesus regardless of our age or our stage of life. And so whether you're single, married with kids, or without kids, or you're a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, or a family friend, there are opportunities for you to invest in the lives of children and students and youth and young adults in, in p- people that God has brought to you in your personal life, the, in your missional community, in your community group, or by serving in the ministries that we have here at Center Street, like children's and grade five, six, youth, crossover, special needs ministries, or our young adults ministry. So with that in mind, I want to focus on how we can launch our children like battleships with a faith that will last a lifetime. And I wanted to thank a few authors and writers who've helped me uh, just put together some of my thoughts for today, including Brian Haynes, David Marvin, Chris Sherry, Christine Hoover, and Tim Elmore. Now, when we look through the Bible, we see it's filled with examples and reminders of how to pass on our faith to those that are coming up behind us. God places a high value on children and the next generation. In Deuteronomy 6 and in Psalm 78, we are reminded that God-fearing parents are called by him, called by him to be intentionally discipling and investing in their children, children who love the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. The question I want to talk about today is how we can launch our kids like battleships with a faith that will last a lifetime. So to help us with this, we're going to be examining the life of Eunice and some intentional things that she did that had a significant impact on her son, Timothy. Now, Timothy was an important person in the Christian faith. He was the apprentice of the Apostle Paul. And he had a significant role in partnering with Paul in spreading the gospel throughout the ancient world. If Paul was Batman in the ancient world, Timothy was his Robin. Timothy is described as having a genuine faith. He was an encourager. He he was selfless. And despite being imprisoned, he never wavered from the faith. And eventually, Timothy would lead one of the largest churches in the ancient world, which many biblical scholars believe was the very first mega church, the church of Ephesus. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 3 to 7, we're introduced to Eunice, again, who raised Timothy to be strong in the faith. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And if you're able to, I invite you to stand with me and join me in the reading of God's word together. Now, because this is a larger passage, I'm going to read for us uh, as we go through, but please follow along. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives power, love, and self-discipline. You may be seated. Now, from our text today, there are three principles that we as parents, but also the larger family of God, can embrace in order to raise this next generation to be strong in the faith. The first principle is this. Model a sincere faith. Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. 
says that Timothy's sincere faith started with his grandma and his mom. Now, they most likely became a follower after hearing Paul preach about grace and forgiveness and a new life in Christ that was made possible through his death and resurrection. They realized that Jesus was indeed the way and the truth and the life, and they put their faith and their trust in him. Eunice modeled a sincere faith where Christ was first in her life. She made sure that Timothy knew the scriptures and knew about Jesus. In 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, You have known the scriptures ever since you were a child. They are able to teach you how to be saved by believing in Christ Jesus. Her pursuit of Jesus impacted not only those around her, but also Timothy, who had a, like a front row seat. He witnessed firsthand the difference that Jesus had made in her life. So many of you know we have a ton of kids in our house. And in the winter, when you live in close quarters with others, uh, if one person gets sick in your home, uh, it doesn't take long for everyone to get sick as well. So regardless of what my kids have, they may as well cough and sneeze in my face because I know I'm going to be getting whatever they have. It's contagious. Well, in the same way, Eunice had a genuine faith that was contagious. So what might a sincere faith look like? A person with a sincere faith makes Jesus their highest priority over every part of their life, including their personal life, their marriage, their family, their work, and ministry. They spend time with Jesus regularly in his word and through prayer. They obey God even when it's hard and uncomfortable. They invest generously with their time and their resources to advance God's kingdom. They go to God first in everything, including their need for direction and strength in life. Modeling a sincere faith is not a Sunday-only relationship with Jesus. And I know, because when our kids are younger, we can say a lot of things to them, and they usually will take what we say at face value. But when they get a little bit older and they start to grow up, especially in the teen years, they can tell what is authentic and real in our lives and what is fake lip service only. The Apostle Paul didn't say, do as I say. No, he didn't say that at all. In 1 Corinthians 11:1, 1, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So the first principle is to model a sincere faith. The second principle to raising this next generation to be strong in the faith is to train faithfully. In chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, Paul writes this to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Eunice not only modeled a sincere faith, she studied the scriptures. She learned it. And then she then went and did what it said. She lived it out in her life. When Paul wrote from infancy, you have known the scriptures, that means that it just didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a once in a while, let's read the, let's, let's read the scriptures together moment. That doesn't just happen. To know something means it saturates every single part of your life. Training our children faithfully involves things like let's open God's word over a meal. Let's talk about what is God saying here. What is he saying to you? What is he saying to us? And what are we going to do about that? And let's pray about it together. Showing our kids what grace and forgiveness looks and feels like. Having our kids see us as parents go to God in the small things, but also the big things that we're facing. 
helping our children understand the physical and the emotional and spiritual needs of people around us and asking them, hey, you guys, what do you think we should do? And as they listen to him and they come with ideas that he's giving them, then you work with them to say, hey, let's work together to meet that, ne that need in the name of Jesus. Making the weekend worship gathering a priority for your family. These are all ways that we can practically do this. One thing we're training in our home is how to cultivate a faith-filled life. Praying with our kids over what we feel God is asking us to do and then learning to walk with him and trust him. When I was making my decision to leave the police service, uh, we involved our children. We involved them in a, that discussion. And I was like super honest with them. I told them about my fears. I told them about the things that I didn't have an answer for yet. The things that I was still praying about. The things that I was worried about, my insecurities. And then I asked them like, guys, please pray for me. I need you, I need us to pray for me. And then another more recent example was just over three years ago, Ari and I felt God was calling us to start fostering and we gathered our family together again and we shared how God had been working in our hearts and invited our kids into that conversation again and we invited them to pray for our next right step. And in both instances and so many more, our family we grew together as we sought the Lord and what he wanted us to do and for our family. And we were able to celebrate together the ways that God moved and provided through it all. Another area that we're trying to practically train up our children in is to teaching them about the, the fruits of the Spirit and how to practically leave, uh, live those out in your life. And one of the areas for our younger ones that we're trying to train in is how to develop self-control. And, and how to treat people, especially your siblings. And I knew we had a problem with self-control when our kids were much younger and uh, we had just parked our van at the store and the sliding door opened and I heard screaming from our five-year-old uh, at the time and she pushed her three-year-old brother out the door and he landed on his head on the ground. And we were beyond self-control at that point. The teaching moment at that time, it escalated from self-control to do not murder, right? <laughs> exactly. And I get it. There are so many things happening in our families where our kids are, they're constantly at each other or they're, they're, they're not making wise decisions or they're, they're not following through on the things that we ask them to do. And as we raise our kids, it's easy to let things slide, to ignore them, to hope that it will get better. But we want to be intentional about going after their hearts and training them day by day, minute by minute, how to practically live out what we read about in the scriptures. And as we've done this, God has given Arian and I opportunities to we we can give an opportunity to grow ourselves, uh, to seek our children's forgiveness and restore our relationships when we've hurt them, giving them a living example of an imperfect parent following a perfect savior. Our kids need to see us genuinely following him, being authentic, and doing what he says. So the first key to raising this next generation to be strong in the faith is to model a sincere faith, to train faithfully, and finally, is to be on mission. Timothy knew what it meant to uh, be to be on mission. It was something that he lived out in his life. It says in verse 6 that he was to fan into flame the gift of God, and he did that through being on mission. In the New Testament, we see how he worked tirelessly to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus, teaching and training early believers in the faith and then helping them to get into community in the local church. Being on mission means that we are aligning our lives with God's purpose and mission. And it is walking closely with Jesus and living out the good news and inviting others to do it with us as we follow him. 
Jesus was pretty clear in Matthew 28 that all of us, not some of us, but all of us are called to be on mission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has placed each of us in our neighborhoods, our communities, our workplaces, the gyms that we go to, the classrooms that we sit in, the sports leagues that we play on, and the friendships that we are in for a reason, to be his representative to a hurting and lost world. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Living out the good news is about representing Jesus in our everyday lives and sharing his love in the real world. When Ari and I were, first, were dating and first married, it was just the two of us, right? And so it was easy to be on mission together. But as our family grew, things became more complicated for us. There was the million diaper changes, the nap schedules, the sports stuff, and the never-ending mountain of laundry that we felt like we could never get out of. We were so busy doing all of these things, we wondered how on earth could we carry out the mission that Christ had called us to. So we tried lots of different things, and some of them were good, were good but most of the time we found ourselves exhausted, stressed, frustrated, and going in separate directions. And I felt so defeated because of the tension that I was feeling inside. That I had to choose between my family or the mission that God had called us to. But then as I studied uh, the life and ministry of Jesus more in the scriptures and how he did mission, I realized Jesus did it differently. Jesus didn't compartmentalize his life doing missions separate from his family. No, he, he invited his spiritual family to join him. And he said, let's do this together. Let's be a family on mission. So Arian and I started taking intentional steps to serve together as a family on mission in the normal, everyday parts of our lives and here at the church. And it hasn't gone perfectly. And there's been lots of bumps and bruises along the way. But through pursuing mission persistently as a family, our kids are serving in the ministries of our church and alongside Arian and I. And they serve not because we make them, but because they want to out of a devotion and love for their Savior. Our conversations around our dinner table, they are different now. We talk about families that, we, that we're serving with or we're serving. And the kids from the weekend that they were serving with that made first time decisions to follow Jesus. We love talking about the next ministry event that's coming up, the non-Christian friends that they are inviting to youth, the neighbors that we've been reaching out to, the spiritual conversation that just happened with the grocery clerk, and how we can provide for the physical or financial needs of others by inviting them over for a meal. When our kids were little, it felt sometimes like, we were pulling and dragging our kids in this. But now that they're older, I'll be honest, it feels that they're challenging and pulling us along. Living on mission as a family means we don't always live what many consider to be a normal life with a normal schedule. Sometimes it means later bedtimes, disrupted schedules and mealtimes, serving at unexpected times, and changes in plans as we try to follow the promptings that God has placed in our hearts. To be honest, sometimes <laughs> we are just so tired sometimes as parents. And I just want to chill out. I do. But nothing brings us greater joy than being all in with Jesus and his mission and seeing our children with joy serve and pursue God and his agenda. Watching how excited they are about the future of our church and wanting to be part of it. And this is already, there are so many ways that we as families can be on mission together. And this is already happening in our church. Did you know that there's a group of young families 
that are, have signed up. They've got little kids. They signed up to take down children's ministries after church as a family, as a young family. And they're doing it for the glory of God. There are other families that are a little, have older kids where they are all serving together in children's ministries or in Awana ministries. They're serving together. They're leading worship. They're teaching. They're leading small groups all for the glory of God. There are other families who just have this amazing love and gift in baking and making incredible food. And together as a family, they pray and they say, God, who, who, who in our lives would you want us to bless this with? And then they go and they give it to them. And as they do, they remind them that they're seen, that they're known, that there's a savior who cares about them. And they pray for them all for the glory of God. Whether we are a single person on mission, a couple on mission, or a family on mission, we are all pursuing God and his mission. And as we do it, those who know us will begin to see what, will begin to see that what we say we believe and what we do are the same. And this isn't a show that we're putting on. It is out of our love for God that we go and do what he asks us to do. So I encourage us this week to all look at our schedules and evaluate the things that we're giving our time to. Let's take a small step of faithful obedience and start doing something. And some of us get caught up with the how. And honestly, when I was talking about inviting somebody over for supper, somebody came to your mind. I know they did. Somebody came to your mind. Don't ignore that. Invite your family. Invite the people that you're doing life with. Invite them to pray with you and say, God, we don't know what you're gonna do, but we're gonna faithfully invite them. We're gonna encourage them and we're gonna walk with them and we're gonna uh, eat a meal with them and then leave the rest up to God. It could be as easy as going for a walk and praying for your neighbors or serving as an individual, a couple or a family in one of the many ministries we have here at Center Street. Uh, and, you know, when I think about what's happening right now, there are so many people that are seeking the Lord. And our church continues to grow, and therefore we just have this amazing need at all of our different campuses. But it's an opportunity, friends. It's an opportunity. There are so many opportunities to be on mission, in children's ministries, in, with students, youth, young, young adults, in leading or hosting a community group in your home, our special needs ministry, Alpha, Freedom Sessions, our building services, our facilities, our food services, and our center for the city. The opportunities to be on mission are so many. There is an incredible thing that God is doing. And now the needs that we have, they used to be space. But now we don't have enough leaders to be able to welcome all the people that God is bringing to us. There's so many opportunities, friends. Don't ignore them. We need you now more than ever to be leaders to step up, to lean in and say, God, I don't know what this looks like, but I know that you can use me. So if you feel stuck and you don't know what to do, start small. It's a simple step of obedience in the name of Jesus and then let him do the rest of the work. So the principles to raising this next generation to be strong in the faith is to model a sincere faith, train faithfully, and then be on mission. I'll close with this. So I realize that after hearing about how well Eunice modeled her love for Christ and trained faithfully, that you may be feeling like a failure or that you aren't measuring up. And if you're like me, I can get caught up in a negative downward spiral that says, man, I, I'm never going to be able to be like them. I've fallen so short of God's call in my life as a parent. It's too late. It's too late. I've made too many mistakes. And then I can believe a lie 
that I shouldn't even try. Some of us in this room just became a Christ follower this year. And your kids, they're not where you're at. And you're like, how on earth am I going to bridge this? How on earth am I going to help them know the Jesus that I know and love? Or maybe you have teenagers in your home and they're in full-blown rebellion and you have no idea what to do or if there's anything you can do at this stage in their life. Or maybe you realize you actually haven't even prayed with your kids or helped them even read his word. Maybe your children are grown up or maybe they're far from God. Maybe you have a broken relationship and they want nothing to do with you. Well, there is more to Eunice's story because before she met Jesus, she made choices that affected the rest of her life. You see, Eunice was Jewish. And even though she knew that she was not supposed to marry someone outside of the Jewish faith and her people, she disobeyed God and she married a man who was Greek. And in that and in time, she gave birth to a boy named Timothy. Now, Timothy didn't have a perfect life, and it wasn't easy growing up for him. It wasn't easy at all. He would have been called a name by everyone, not some, but by everyone. He would have been called a mamzer, a name that was given to those who were considered illegitimate children because their parents married outside of God's people. He would have been ridiculed ridiculed, seen as an outcast, prevented from even going into the synagogue. But then one day, Eunice repented. She believed and professed faith in Jesus Christ, and she was made new again. And that changed everything in her life. She turned her eyes towards Jesus and modeled for Timothy a sincere faith. She trained him faithfully and stirred up this missional spark in him that would be fanned into flame. And she is a powerful reminder that there is nothing, friends, listen, there is nothing in our past that God cannot redeem. And we find stories like Eunice down throughout history over the past 2,000 years where God takes the brokenness of our lives and he brings beauty out of them. He takes hardships in marriages and he brings forgiveness. He brings prodigals back to himself. He breaks down the walls of bitterness in our lives towards others and he brings restoration. He brings peace to our restless hearts and homes. Every one of us has a story. And when we invite God into our brokenness, our our heartache, and put our faith and trust in him, he begins a new work. But we have an enemy. Our enemy, Satan, wants us to believe the lie that it's too late, that it's too far gone, our relationships are too broken, that we've made too many mistakes to be worthy of God's grace. He wants us to believe that we are alone and that nobody cares. No, we're not doing enough. We're not measuring up ourselves. We're not measuring up as we compare our lives to the highlight reels of other people. He wants us to be paralyzed in fear. Paralyzed to the point where instead of taking a small step of obedience, we do absolutely nothing. And I get it. It's exhausting being a parent. Because sometimes you don't know. You can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes it feels like I'm on this treadmill that's like constantly going and it never stops. And you're just trying to make sure that everyone's wearing pants for the day. The thought of doing anything more feels like a mountain that I can't climb. But I can tell you from everything that I've read in the scriptures, 
that when we prioritize our God-given responsibility of leading and guiding and training our children in the way that they should go, it is worth it. Arian and I want our children to be set up with everything that they need, spiritually and emotionally, mentally, so that when we launch them as battleships, they will go into battle prepared for whatever's going to come their way. We want them to be grounded in their identity in Christ and his word. We want them to be ready for the storms that are going to come. When doubt creeps in, when question about their faith, that they have this strong conviction within them that God's word can be trusted and that they can lean on it and they can stand firm in what God says and the truth of who he says they are. Now, as I've been speaking today, I'm pretty certain that some of us may be filled with reminders of hurt, pain, and areas of our lives where we feel like we've fallen short because of busyness, different priorities, or that promise you made that you're gonna start on Monday and it never happened. Please know that my prayer was not to add to your hurt and pain today. Because I know something is very true of our God. God is in the business of restoring. He is a rebuilding, restoring, renewing, making all things new God. He uses our brokenness, the pieces of our lives, and he uses them for his glory. We may be filled with worry about tomorrow, about our kids, about our relationships, our school, our, our finances, our work, our health. But remember, tomorrow, tomorrow is in his hands. Today's Mother's Day, and I wanted to say a few words to our mothers. So I'm just going to ask all of our moms to stand. Our bio moms, our foster moms, our adoptive moms, our grandmas, and our spiritual moms. At all of our campuses, I invite you to stand. Moms, I want you to remember and know how much you matter. You are deeply loved. You are loved by God, not for what you do or how put together you appear, but because of who you are. You are his daughters. And I know so often you feel like you're failing and you're not enough. And when I think about my mom or my wife, Arian, I realize how much I have failed to recognize them and say thank you. So thank you, moms, for all of the late nights, all of the details that you hold and you move forward, for, the, for all the balls that you juggle, for the million Cheerios that have been picked up, for the countless times that you have sacrificed without anyone applauding or saying thank you. But God has seen every single thankless act of service you do for your family and the people that God has brought into your life, every tear that you have cried, and every prayer that you have prayed. We need you in our church family, moms, and we are so thankful for you. I'm going to ask uh, everyone who's influencing this next generation to stand. This is our fathers, our biological parents, our grandparents, our foster parents, our adoptive parents, and our spiritual parents. Thank you, friends, for the ways that you love and care for and invest in those around you. God knows all of your insecurities, your worries, and your fears. He cares for you in the midst of all that you are facing, and thank you for your faithfulness. Don't give up. Don't give up from doing good. Lean into the Lord and those God has brought into your life to support and help you in this journey. Parents, we need you to be strong, to be fierce, to be courageous, to stand up and to fight for our families. The enemy's not going to get them. He's not. Because we serve a God who cares and knows and has already defeated him. We need you to link arms with one another and engage and involved in our church's mission. Because we're raising the next generation who will, by God's grace, will love and serve him wholeheartedly with all of their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. 
And so as I wrap up, I want to pray and bless you. So if you're near a parent standing, please extend your hand towards them and join me in praying with them, over them today. God, I thank you for every mom and parent that is standing here today. We are blessed by who they are and the countless things that they do to invest in those that they love. As they go about each day, may they find their identity in you. Not in their kids, not in their work or their relationships, but in you and you alone. May you be their strength when they are weak. May you comfort them in their hurts. May we remind them that you see them and that you love them. And I pray that you would help all of us to be an encouragement in their lives, to pray for and encourage them regularly. And I pray for the rest of us that we would pursue a sincere, genuine faith that puts you first in our lives, that we would faithfully encourage and equip those you have brought into our lives, and that we would link arms together to be a church family on mission for you. And I pray all of these things in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, the rest of us, all of us, to stand. And as we close, I, I invite you uh, to join to, together as a church family to sing a song that reminds us that sometimes in our lives it feels like a battle. Doesn't it? Yeah. It feels like a battle. Battles in our homes, our parenting, our relationships, our marriages, our workplaces, our friendships, our schools, but also even in our thinking. But the battle, friends, that we are in, it's not hopeless. It's not. Because we can walk in confidence that no matter what comes our way, we are going to overcome because of the grace and the hope that we have in our risen Savior and our faithful God. Let's sing this together.